Uh, our final speaker for this morning session is Dr. Uh, Nelly Arguello Blanco from Ohio State University. Uh, Nelly is going to be talking with us about effects on wheat genome from five rapid genomic selection cycles. I've been a doctor two days, so please don't judge me today. Um, I am very happy to be here today. Thank you for, uh, to the organizers for giving me this chance. And I am going to present one of my objectives uh, in my dissertation. Um, I work for one of Dr. Gina Brown's guys, Dr. Clay Snyder at The Ohio State University. So I'm going to talk about wheat breeding using genomic selection, and particularly I want to present the effects of rapid cycling on the genome. Uh, why continue to breed uh, wheat? Three reasons. First one, continues to provide 20% of your calories for a population that only continues to grow. What doesn't grow, though, is the, la the land we have for cultivation. So we need to provide this food for this population growing and 20% of your calories. Breeding is just a cycle. It's quite simple. Initiates with having genetic diversity, which everyone has been talking about in the morning. Also, people talked about testing for your diversity. You want to find that particular trait and that particular diversity. And then you make selections. With selections, what you want to do is you initiate it with a population with a given mean and a given variance. With your selections, you want to increase that population mean while you still keep some of the variance. Your best selections will become, will become either release varieties or new parents to go to the next step, which is initiating your crosses. So this is a cycle <clears throat> at Ohio State for soft red winter wheat. It takes about seven years um, in the phenotyping breeding scheme. In uh, around 20, 2012, Dr. Sneller started genomic selection. Um, and what he, what he found is that um, he can conduct one breeding cycle in about a year. And this occurs in the greenhouse. And it takes a year because we're skipping some of the phenotyping. I want to make sure that everyone understands that I define a breeding cycle from the time when you make a cross and then you select an individual for a new cross. We're not talking about yield trials yet. So in that sense, since we're cycling alleles really fast, we wanted to look at what happens once you take an initial uh, training population and when you go through rapid cycling, what happens to the genome. But then you wonder, why would you want to look at the genome? Just show me some phenotypes and some increase in yield. But let me tell you why you need to worry about the genome. <clears throat> Genomic selection has many, many benefits, and lots of people are using it, but it relies on prediction accuracy. But guess what? Your prediction accuracy is very effective for anything that has to do with the genome, particular population structure, linkage to equilibrium, and uh, losing your uh, alleles. So then, remember, I went from seven years for one cycle to five cycles in one year, which I'll tell you later. Um, but we don't know what the effect is on the genome, and that's actually what I studied. <clears throat> I also don't have a voice today, so I'm sorry. <clears throat> so that's, uh, we want to look at what happened to this genome after five rapid cycles. Um, I want to say that I am not going through a, a regular presentation. For me to be able to explain to you what I did, I'll just present my methods and uh, along with it, the result that I got from every analysis. So when Clay Sneller uh, initiated uh, genomic selection in wheat, he initiated this with a training population with 470 um, breeding lines. He phenotyped that population for um, grain yield, emphasizing head blight uh, primarily. Um, and then we genotype it with about 4,000 uh, <clears throat> uh, DNA markers. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> we analyze 
that data and build prediction models. We use every uh, prediction model that you probably know, and we chose the one with the highest accuracy and the lowest computation uh, consumption. <clears throat> With that model, you predict the uh, genomic estimated breeding values, and you initiate genomic selection. So, uh, in that for that case, we would select the best individuals coming from your training population. You make a cross, harvest the F1 seed, and then <clears throat> you sell that to the F2, and then you genotype the population of F2 plants, and that process all occurs in a greenhouse and takes about a year. That was your first uh, genomic selection cycle, your first um, individuals that now you can use for this F2 population of nines. <clears throat> you use the very same model that you use building with your train, built with your training population, and you estimate your GBBs. Thank you. <clears throat> So again, you, you use the same model <clears throat> that you have built with your training population. You estimate uh, genomic estimated breeding values for every individual from cycle one. Those individuals are at the F2 generation. Then you just continue doing the same. You select the best GBBs from cycle one to initiate cycle two. And this is how fast it goes. In about, a, in about a year, you get one cycle. So rapid cycling. Five cycles in about five years for soft red winter wheat at the Ohio State University. All of these cycles occur in the greenhouse. <clears throat> so how is it that I analyze the genome? And by now, uh, now I want to define what I call a genome. The genome is the collection of those markers that I, <clears throat> I built a model with, with my train, training population. And to study the genome, I, had, I, choose, I chose one allele. I chose the major allele, just to follow that major allele and see how that changed <clears throat> uh, throughout the cycles. So I'm always using training population as the reference and major allele present in the training population. So I looked at uh, allele frequency, which is the first thing you look at when you're studying populations. Um, polymorphism information content for the quality of your marker. I conduct a regression analysis for both the frequency and the PAC to see if there was significant um, change in allele frequency. And I conducted drift simulations to be able to differentiate between alleles that were under selection and alleles that were lost through a genetic drift. <clears throat> so with this, uh, uh, looking at this data, I am going to be able to answer questions like, did rapid cycling change the allele frequency in a significant way? And is that uh, change in frequency driven by selection or by drift? <clears throat> And was that change in frequency uh, good enough to uh, reduce uh, diversity to cause population differentiation? Remember, we're always using the training population as reference. And uh, what, what about the impact on linkage disequilibrium? So again, remember, it's not a regular presentation where you describe your methods and then you jump to your results. So I am, this is a nice reminder that TP is our reference, that I looked at grain yield, fusarium head blight, and other traits, but particularly we focus on grain yield because that's what the farmer gets paid for. <clears throat> so the very first thing was, what, what about your uh, genomic estimated breeding values? Um, on your y-axis, you see the trait this one, for example, is um, our location northwest. This one is in Worcester, where we are based. Um, on your y-axis, you see uh, the tray value, and it's color-coded uh, by the population. <clears throat> so what, you want, what I want you to focus on is, uh, example, in Worcester, you can see how there is a steady increase on the population mean um, for grain yield, as well as the reduction in the variance. <clears throat> And, and that was true for every, every 
every location, but more for Worcester because it's, it had a greater heritability, <clears throat> which is good because that's our main location. And it wasn't so much true for Fusarium head blight. And the reason is when we were selecting after the second cycle in here, see from cycle one to cycle two, there was a decrease on the uh, um, symptoms for Fusarium head blight, which is what we want to have. But after cycle two, we were not concerned to, uh, on selecting for FHP anymore. So what, is, what was more important for me, was there any significant change in earlier frequency uh, in reference to your training population? For me to say that an allele is an under, uh, it's, it's significantly changing, uh, remember I said that I conducted a regression analysis with the major allele and uh, the polymorphism information content. So any marker that had an R square for that model greater than 0.7 and a p-value smaller than 0.05 would be considered to be in a linear uh, uh, change of frequency. And what I found is that uh, about 27% of my initial genome <clears throat> is changing significantly, and the rest is not. Then we wanted to know, is it selection or is it drift? To say, from those significant markers. To say that, what I did is that I initiated with every frequency I observed and the training population for the major allele, I use that to simulate genetic drift for about six cycles. And I built a normal distribution with that. And I said that a marker is under selection if the frequency, if the probability of observing the frequency of that major allele in my cycle five is smaller than Point of, uh, smaller than 0 0.05, just like a regular normal distribution. <clears throat> and so what we found, and it's hidden in there, what we found is that about 18% um, of the markers that uh, we uh, in studied were actually under selection. Uh, some, some of 9.3%, uh, <clears throat> 9, 9 we were unable to determine if they were under selection or under drift. And the reason is the probability of finding that frequency was greater than 0.05. So we cannot distinguish that. But what about allele fixation? I say that an allele is fixed if I looked at the frequency and it's greater than 0.99 or it's smaller than 0.01. And what we found is uh, what, only 1.3% of uh, initial markers were fixed. But what's interesting in here is that a big portion of what was not changing significantly, which is randomly, uh, is actually fixed. So we're losing alleles more uh, through drift than through selection. In total, we found about 18.5% of uh, my total genome being fixed and 13% of that is due to genetic drift. But you know, allele frequencies, that's what we want to change when we were uh, do, uh, doing breeding, right? But what about population uh, differentiation? And this, remember, this is <clears throat> in the sense of genomic selection. I conducted a discriminant analysis of principal components. On your x-axis, you see the first uh, discriminant function. On your y-axis, the second <clears throat> discriminant function. This is actually a very simple graph, color-coded uh, color and symbol for populations. Here is your training population, and here is cycle one, cycle two, three, four, and five. Very nice and easy. What you can look at is how that is deviating from your training population. That's something we don't want to see because we may be compromising genomic selection accuracy. So when we looked at the FST on your y-axis and uh, when we compare those for the difference in cycle number, so example, if, num if you look at number two, I'm looking at training population and estimating the FST between the TP and cycle number two, hence the two. So what we see is that the FST is steadily increasing as you go through the cycles with a slope of 0.045. And that seems a little small, though in terms of population genetics, an FSD value of 0.224 is considered to be a highly differentiated population. <clears throat> so that has to have an influence on our linkage disequilibrium. <clears throat> 
So why is linkage disequilibrium important? Um, because it determines your accuracy. So we conducted a mental test with the LD matrices, um, and what we found is that, shoot, what we found is that um, that correlation of L, uh, linkage disequilibrium mental test is decreasing, and that's what determines your accuracy. If you don't have the same scheme of linkage disequilibrium, now you're reducing your accuracy. So again, this is a summary. I wanted to look at the genome. I found a reduction in variance. I found significant change in allele frequency changes, uh, deviation in, uh, in terms of FST and linkage disequilibrium, and that is important for genomic selection. Um, and here you can see the implications uh, for breeding. We, we present this graph as this is the way we conduct a genomic selection, but definitely you have to think about a co-evolution between your training population and your prediction population, which is what people are already doing. But now, and we, we know we are phenotyping constantly, so you have to rethink that and know where you invest your resources. And I cannot go without thanking uh, everyone. And Dr. Gina Brown yesterday talked about having more women participating in breeding. I want to make everyone aware of this organization. They funded part of, they funded part of my uh, research. Um, and that is Clay Sneller. Thank you very much. <laughs>